Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Today we're going to continue in our study through the Gospel of John. We're picking up in the 10th chapter of John. Um, we're picking up our discussion in verse 11, but here in a minute we'll step back and kind of get into that section a little bit farther. Um, we have several who have joined us already. We have David Clark, Caleb Davis, Jimmy Kersey, Danielle Forrest, and Aline Haynes. Um, if you are joy, if you've joined us and we don't know who you are, then drop a comment. Um, if you would, you can comment to on the live study on our Facebook page, the comment section, connect with the study or on our YouTube channel. We also have a comment, a chat area, connect with live video. And just tell us if you don't mind, just your first name, where you're from. And that way we know who we're talking to. But if you have any questions or comments, you can use those avenues to bring them into the study. All right, let's bring Mr. Brian in. And there's just the two of us today, Brian. Just yeah, the um, two of us. We like to call this the brain trust, obviously. That's the... <laughs> well, I feel like it is a true, genuine split. We have some with hair, some without hair. Yeah. But so we're not going to be similar... splitting hairs. That's right. Yeah. We're splitting hairs today. <laughs> All righty. Um... I guess everything's going well for you? Yes, very much so. We Good. just finished that bomb cyclone everybody was talking about, so we're getting oh, out of that sorry. weather. Yeah, so, which really which really isn't too different than normal weather here. It's rainy and cold, so. Okay, speaking of bomb weather, is that what you said? That's what I said, yeah. Yeah. We, have we got Bob, Bob with in. us. <laughs> Hello there, Mr. Bob. Oh, Bob, you're muted. Well, there you go. Okay. That's better. I can hear you now. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to be picking up in John chapter 10 um, here in just a moment. Um, kind of a future note of things. Next week being Thanksgiving, we won't have a study. So stay at home. Stay off your computer. Whatever you want to do. Enjoy the turkey or your family, or if you have both turkey and family together, then, you know, <clears throat> so, but we won't have a study next week. And then Lord willing, we'll continue, of course, after that. And we may have more back with us. A lot depends. So kind of keep in mind, and I know you already know this, when we have the six of us participating in the study, oftentimes um, our individual lives are very busy. You know, now some of us might be like Brian, who doesn't have anything better to do than host like, you know, two or three studies during the course of the week. But of us, others of us who just preach, well, we don't have anything other to do too. So, and few of us may work two or three jobs, who knows? But anyway. Well, I had, um, had two Bible classes with Indian preachers uh, Tuesday night. So, Do you really? Yeah. Well, Is, one of them was a... a uh, a class of preachers and other was a congregation of okay. gender mix. How does, a good time. Does, does that work well? It works pretty well. They, they got one guy that understands English and he's the main guy. He translates. Okay. I try to get them in short bursts. And, That's uh, impressive. Yeah. we study for about 30 to 45 minutes. It's good to see that desire to want to have a study like that. Yeah, they've been very, very uh, appreciative. Yeah, good. And when I tell you, when the Indian preachers read the scriptures out loud, they stand. <clears throat> Just like I, uh, people yeah. in uh, Ezra's day. I've heard um, of, I haven't heard about, no, maybe I take that back. One of our, one of our members is from India. Her and she grew up, her father preaches over in India. And um, they may, her and her husband may have told me about that. It's interesting, you know, the, the, but so they sit down when they're not reading the scriptures? Yeah, they, they stand up, read the scripture, and, and then take their seat again. And then they preach? Yeah, what, what I do, I let them read the text that I'm going to be going okay. over because I don't speak Telugu yeah. and I don't have a Telugu translation. So I let him read it out of the Telugu and uh, they'll read it and 
again, like I said, the, the, one of the preachers will read it and he'll sit down and, and I will start and I will explain, explain the text uh, as simply as I can and in short bursts and then the, the English speaking preacher there, he'll translate it for the class. Okay. There are some churches I've heard of um, who will, during the scripture reading or any reading of the scripture, will ask everyone to stand for the reading of the scripture. Yeah. But that's a little bit different. That, I mean, I know it shows respect for the word, but it's not quite the same as in Ezekiel's day. Right. Yeah. All righty. Well, I'm glad, glad, glad that's going well for you. Let's go ahead and start our reading in John chapter 10, verse 7. In this section here, kind of continuing with the discussion of Jesus being the shepherd. Um, and he talks about the doorkeeper in the preceding verses there. To him, the doorkeeper opens, that is to the shepherd and the only true shepherd. But then beginning in verse 7, we now see Jesus being referred to differently. And so, Brian, if you would, let's start in 7. And let's go ahead and read through the end of the section, which is verse 21, I believe. Okay. Uh, John chapter 10, verses 7 through 21. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go out, go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Uh, sorry, I just lost my place there. Uh, the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command... I have received from my father. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Okay. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Bride. So we already, last week we looked at verses 7 through 10, where he says, I am the door of the sheep. So he's gone from being the shepherd. Now he's the door of the sheep. Verse 9 again, he says, I am the door. Differentiates the difference between him, self, who is the door, and those who would come in to seek, steal, and destroy. With any thoughts about that before we resume the discussion in verse 11? <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's look then, Brian. Now we have the next thing. So we have... He begins with, he's a shepherd. You have someone who watches the door. Now he is the door. And now verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. Um, and he gives life for the sheep. Verses 11, 12, he comes back to differentiating the difference. Sorry. He's differentiating between him, the actual shepherd, and the hireling. What is that difference there? Well, he says the hireling, it doesn't really have the same vested interest that the good shepherd does. The hireling, uh, when the hireling sees problems, the hireling runs away, he says. But the good shepherd cares so much about the sheep, he says, that uh, I would the good shepherd will give his life for the sheep. And uh, so, so that's his distinction he makes here. What is intriguing about that is when he says at the latter part, part of 12, um, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. You know, you, you kind of think about some levels of persecution. Um, the sheep don't have any focal point to stay around protection. The hireling leaves. And you think about the persecution through the years have tried to scatter the sheep in some respects. 
But in this case in point, it's scattering the sheep away from their fold of safety. When it comes to disciples of Christ, even though we may face persecution, we are all still safe within that fold. Because of the good shepherd there. Um, yeah, yeah. And you hit got a question in the chat. Oh, 13 sorry. says he, you know, he doesn't care about the sheep. That is, of course, the hireling. All right, yeah, let's go ahead and we'll bring that in. Jimmy says, is the door metaphor similar to the ones used in the Old Testament? Or am I thinking of idols, the blood over the door, or am I completely off? Ryan, I'll, if you want to tackle whether or not Jimmy's completely off, yeah. <laughs> then go ahead. <laughs> It's a good I'll question. get in trouble. It, Jimmy, I actually think you're spot on to catch that there's something significant about this language about the door. Um, in the Old Testament, the door, can I say the door metaphor? It's not always a metaphor, but it's, uh, I would say it's an allegory of some kind in the New Testament, is the idea of the thing you're passing through to get to safety. So we mentioned this, I think, briefly last time, that you have in the idea of like the ark. There's one door to get in. You get in the ark, you're safe. You know, the destruction that's going to go on outside. Once you're inside, you're safe. And we see something similar with, uh, you mentioned the Passover home. And that's another great example. You pass through that door with the blood on it. Uh, once you're in that place, you're going to be safe from that destroyer that's taking the firstborn. Uh, even Rahab's house has a similar uh, connection there to the idea of a place where you enter into the safety. So Jesus says, I am the door. And I like to play with this a little bit when we talk about baptism. The idea of saying that when I pass through... Christ in baptism, which I'm putting on Christ. I'm, you know, connecting myself with Christ. What happens? Well, I'm added to the household of faith. I'm, I'm added to the, the ark that is the church. You could say I'm brought into that place, you know, and the ark was covered with tar, you know, the, the, the Passover door was covered with blood. You have these ideas of something that protects, you know, even Rahab's house, having the red, uh, the red scarlet hanging out of it, you know, that these places of security that something marks them as safe, uh, the church is marked by the blood of Christ, so it's the thing that's going to be safe in the wrath that is to come. Uh, you know, when we pass through Christ in baptism, I think this is a baptism reference in a very abstract way. Jesus being the door, we have to pass through him. He'll say later in John chapter 14, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. If I, if I want to get to the Father, if I want to get to the good pasture, if I want an eternal life, I have to go through Christ. I have to be baptized into Christ. And I, and I think actually, Jimmy, I think you're spot on to see something that, that uh, in the Old Testament, I believe was a foreshadow of the, the language of salvation in the New Testament about that, that singular way to enter the kingdom, that singular way to enter a place of salvation. So, uh, Jimmy, I think it's a great comment. I do. That's a good point. Great explanation, too, of the way that that, that develops. Um, I've often found interesting, you kind of not directly connected with what Jimmy's question was, but with what you were saying there, that even the ceremonial cleansing that they had to go through before going into the temple was a shadow of the cleansing that we have through Christ through the, in that Avenue, going through baptism, washing away our sins, you know, coupling of course with the full obedience, but yeah, that's good. Great answer. Connection between the labor outside mm -hmm. the, uh, the temple and yeah. and back the priests the first thing they did before going to the temple they they would uh wash they'd take off their civvies yeah. they would wash and then put on their garments their priestly garments and then they would go in uh but if we view and i believe it is justified from the book of hebrews the holy place the first compartment as the church then the first thing we need to do before we can enter the holy place is to wash yeah. or be baptized. <clears throat> then, of course, yeah. we put in that we put on the the new man or the new clothing of righteousness and become actual priests in that act of baptism. And then we go into the uh, into the church and we perform the priestly uh, priestly duties of offering up spiritual sacrifices. And uh, so there's all kinds of analogies that we can uh, connect to the Old Testament where doors are concerned. And this happens to be the door of the uh, temple, the holy place. Uh, you had to wash before you could go in. And of course, even there, though the blood had not been shed, the blood of Jesus Christ would be shed. And as we sometimes say, it flows backwards and forwards. 
And so it was by the blood, really, that they were able to go into the the blood. Yeah. Jesus, they were able to go into the temple cleansed. I mean, the tabernacle. Uh, the Good Yeah, point. the temple. Well, both. The holy place cleansed. Yeah. That's a good point. Good point. Good thought. All right. So with that being said, when we continue down into verse 14, kind of pop that back up on the screen here real quick. Again, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And this time he talks about knowing his sheep and his sheep, his sheep, sorry, being known by him. I know my sheep and am known by my own. But then notice in verse 15, he makes a connection here. As a father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So you have an interesting picture here being formed. You have Jesus knowing the father and Jesus knows the father. And then we have Jesus being the shepherd knows the sheep and the sheep knows the shepherd. And fundamentally we see the purpose for why Jesus came verse 15. And I lay down my life for the sheep going back to the whole discussion of the hireling versus the shepherd where the hireling doesn't care for the sheep and will let the wolves come in and take the scatter the sheep and the hireling will run and save his own life. Whereas the actual shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. Um, any thoughts about that before we look at verse 16? You know, I think it's Isaiah, isn't it? That says, uh, all my, all my sheep, all my, uh, my sheep. I can't remember the now the exact words, but, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah. But Jesus, as the good shepherd, he brings the lost sheep that were straying. He brings them back into the fold. Uh, that's, that's the responsibility. One of the responsibilities of a good shepherd to keep the, the fold intact and to go out and get the sheep. And of course you've got the 99, uh, safe and the one that was lost in, in the parable in Luke chapter 15. Uh, yeah. which goes along with that also. Okay. That's a good point. I've sometimes, point. I've sometimes wondered if uh, the, we mentioned earlier, there were the thieves that came in and now we're talking about the hirelings. And I've kind of wondered um, who, if that, if they're actually kind of a reference to something more particular, in other words, are like the hirelings, the, the leaders of Israel at his time and the, the thieves, the false prophets or something. Um, and I don't know if Jesus really meant for it to be that detailed, but um, you know, this, just the fact that he's mentioning that there are hirelings makes me wonder if, if maybe he's suggesting that there are some people that are hirelings, you know, that they're the, merely the caretakers of Israel, the, you know, and that, and, and if so, then it, maybe that would fit to the leaders of the time. They're nothing more than the hirelings and they really don't have that genuine compassion and love for Israel. Um, I don't know. Like I said, it could be, it could be further than Jesus means for us to go, but it, I've just wondered sometimes. Well, let me, all right, you, you said that. Let me, let me, let me bring something in discussion. It has nothing to do with conversation except for this little sliver that you just stated here. Okay. So this is all your fault. Um, I think that's a very, I think it's a very good point because you think about, you go back to Romans chapter three, where he talks about then what good then did it serve the Jews having the oracles of God? And he goes in much in every way. Okay. So they were oracles of God. The law was entrusted to the Jews, but the Jewish leaders, by the time of Christ, they were not binding it the way that God was supposed to had wanted them to bound it. Interesting point then. All right. John, the baptizer preached against Herod because Herod was married to Herodias. Herodias had been previously married to Philip, Herod's brother. So John says it was not lawful for Herod to have his brother's wife, Herodias. And in Mark's account, it says that they were married. That is Herod and Herodias. Okay. Now here's the question that was brought up in, in, in a commentary and it was Mark Kyle Cope's commentary. And he referenced David McClister's, I think his statement, but the point is why weren't the Jewish leaders up in arms over this marriage relationship? Well, the common view of the day is that a man could put his way his wife for any cause. Okay. But if they were going to be the true doorkeepers, making certain that the law was properly taught to the people and the people lived according to the law, then they would have honored God's original intent regarding the marital relationship. And they would have stood opposed to Herod's marriage to Herodias, even those who were in the region of Perea that was beyond the Jordan. Um, 
I, I, I've been, I've got to cover Matthew 19, the first part of this upcoming Sunday. And I hadn't really thought about the question, why didn't the Pharisees take John's position and stand opposed to Herod? You know, even if they agreed with what John was saying, they still would have feared for their own life. Any thoughts about that? And that's kind of a bigger basket of discussions, but. It, it is it is a bigger question for sure. Um, and one thing to think about too is is whether or not Herod was subject to the law of Moses. Um, because Herod, you know, his, I think, I think he was, you know, was he half Jewish? I can't even remember if his mother is the, the Jewish wife of Herod the Great, but, um, whether or not he's even subject to the law of Moses, uh, he doesn't seem to be, he doesn't seem Herod, to Herod see himself. Yeah. Herod Antipas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he doesn't really seem to be subject to the law of Moses in many ways. Um, uh, but he's still subject to a law of marriage. And you could even point out mm -hmm. that as, as Jesus will in his, you know, you're going to teach Matthew 19. So Jesus mm -hmm. will give his law of marriage. And he says, my law of marriage goes back, you know, to the original law that perhaps Herod is in that sense uh, against that. There, there's a very complicated language here about, you know, the Bible says that the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. This is Luke 16, 16. Uh -huh. And then from the time of John the Baptist on, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So it could be that John the Baptist is rebuking Herod based on Jesus's law of marriage. Um, which, which is again, kind of an interesting thought because as you yeah. said, in the law of Moses, there might've been some, uh, you know, some argument there and, and whether or not he's even under the law of Moses is questionable, but, but it does say repeatedly, it says that John the Baptist and Jesus preached the gospel. Um, that could be the source of that rebuke. I really struggle with that. I, you know, I really kind of struggle because I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, uh, when John is rebuking Herod, what what the basis of that rebuke is uh, you know is it that he is actually you know as i said there luke 16 16 says they that they are teaching the gospel i mean mark chapter 1 and verse 1 says that the gospel begins with john the baptist so yeah. um you know uh, and and jesus is teaching uh in matthew 19 is is prefaced by matthew 5 and matthew 4 says that is that matthew 5 is the teaching of the gospel so Again, all of these things connect in that yeah. in that language, but but I'm not entirely sure. So all that being said, I'm not entirely sure what John's uh, you know as John is rebuking him. Is he doing so because this is the law of Christ? Is he doing so because as as a not being a Jew, Herod might have still been subject to the original law of Genesis chapter uh, two, or is it something else like you know this is your your brother's wife and you know that that's there's something to that as well. Um, so yeah. I'll just, I'll just say there's a lot to think about, but not maybe necessarily an easy answer. Well, the one thing I didn't nope. think about that you mentioned is based on that, the Jews would not have, they had long since gone past God's law that was established in the beginning, even because of the hardness of their hearts. So they would not have even been motivated to have rebuked Herod because they, they probably would have agreed with it you know, based on what their viewpoint of the day was potentially. Sorry, Bob, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that I see continuity throughout all the, all three major dispensations uh, is the uh, true righteousness, the righteousness of God, principles of righteousness, righteous principles. That's what the patriarchy uh, undergirded the patriarchy it undergirded the law of Moses and it undergirds the gospel as the principles of righteousness. That's what I see in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is not preaching the law of Moses. He's not preaching particularly the New Testament. He's pre preaching the uh, principles of righteousness that under, have undergirded all of God's covenants. Uh, we, we've got to be righteous if we want to benefit uh, from these uh, from these covenants and getting back to John chapter 10 mm -hmm. I see three parallels here uh, uh, the one who does not enter uh, the sheepfold by the door climbs up some other way he's a thief and a robber and then on down here in verse uh, in verse uh, 10 the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then down here in, in the next section that we read this morning, uh, the hireling uh, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. Well, he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf comes, uh, catches the sheep and scatters them. 
He's killing them by leaving them. He's not killing them directly, the hireling, uh, but he is killing them indirectly by leaving them uh, for the wolves yeah. and uh, leaving them defenseless against these uh, wolves. And so in all three of those, you've got the uh, killing and destroying as, as well as the, uh, the leaving, uh, the fleeing from it. And so as a result of the fleeing, the sheep are destroyed by the wolves. That's a good point. And, and I think let's tie back what Bob said, Brian, what you said. I think it's a very good point to say or to suggest even that the hireling, he could have been referring to the Jewish leaders of the day. Oh, yeah. Because they clearly had dropped the, their responsibility. Matthew 23, they had clearly dropped the responsibility that the Lord had given them to properly teach and uphold the law. And where is it? It's somewhere in the gospel that Jesus uh, saw the uh, Israel as shepherd without a sheep or sh yes sheep without a shepherd yeah yeah uh, get there compassion on them leaders, but they weren't shepherds they weren't exactly. shepherding they weren't protecting the flock against the wolves they were the wolves yeah that's that's a very good point yeah he, he says that he says that at least once maybe two times he's looking out over the crowd he has compassion on them yeah he's a sheep without a shepherd yeah uh, two things here real quick. I'm going to share what Brian had shared with the, the, the chat and the com in the chat in the comment section. Um, he had shared earlier in the discussion there of Isaiah 53, six this is what Bob had referenced. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then Jimmy shares a passage from the new Testament, first Peter two 25, uh, for we, you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, what I've done is I have brought that up on the big screen. Well, I had it brought up on the big screen. Let's turn over there for just a moment and let's look at the passage, just a little bit more detail of what Jimmy was sharing there. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So if we Where come up just, this is a first John two, I'm starting in, uh, really 21 first John first Peter boy brains not working right today first Peter 2 21 for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his footsteps wow how do I still have Bob up on the screen there there well, we go a good well <laughs> I know what went wrong over here hang on there we go there we go. I got, I need to fix. Never mind. Bob joined us and added a third person and it threw something off in my component here and I didn't catch it in time. Not a problem. We love Bob for to this, you were called being because Christ also served for suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. I thought it was a good connection there. And I kind of wanted to show kind of the fuller context there. Of what we're looking at. To, to the, uh, the labor. That's when, uh, we die to sins and mm. then, uh, uh, live for righteousness, walk in newness of life or put on the priestly garments. Uh, so those three things are, are common at our, are in common and parallel. Yeah. Um, Caleb, kind of, Caleb kind of catches up. <laughs> no offense, Caleb. He catches up though with, with this question. Um, does the servant who leave, leaves represent, does the servant who leaves represent the religious leaders or could be those today who should stand for truth, but leave God's word to please men. All right. That's an interesting secondary point that we could pull from that. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Especially could that also represent religious leaders today who don't lead people through the word of God? It, I always think there, there was yeah. the initial uh, application to the Jewish leaders, but certainly anyone who purports to be a religious leader, especially 
if they uh, represent themselves as Christian leaders, as, as it were, or, or gospel preachers. Uh, and I hate the term uh, uh, televangelists because most of the people who are preaching on television are not evangelists at all. Yeah. Uh, they are pro proponents of false doctrine. But uh, yeah, I certainly see an application there to us as well. Yeah. But, uh, Brian, you had a, a connection you want to make here real quick. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Zechariah chapter 11, the prophet Zechariah is charged with, and I think maybe even literally charged with going out and getting a flock and hiring bad shepherds, shepherds who didn't care for the flock, didn't take care of the flock, didn't feed the flock. Um, and he talks about feeding the flock for slaughter, you know, and he talks about how these bad shepherds are, are like Israel. Israel has bad shepherds. They're not being led the right way. Which is kind of neat because Zechariah 11 leads into a pretty significant uh, uh, messianic prophecy about Jesus being the good shepherd, uh, the breaking of the covenant of Israel, and the you know the idea of that covenant being restored later. So it's all kind of a neat uh, read too. If you were to read Zechariah chapter 11 in relationship to these things and the bad uh, the bad shepherds that Zechariah was charged to hire. You get a good sense of you know what's a bad shepherd look like they're not feeding the flock they don't care about the flock they just let the flock loose and and uh you know he's and, and he says i had to just fire shepherd after shepherd because they didn't care and that's god is saying i've got have had a lot of those with my flock israel and and here is jesus saying look i'm it i'm the real good shepherd that they have and i care so much about them i die for them it's good for you know, read zechariah 11 and then go into 12 and you kind of see the, the whole story yeah Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, when you when you consider all of this, uh, it is no small wonder that we have two lists of qualifications for shepherds. First uh, Timothy chapter three and Titus chapter one. Uh, you, you can't let just anybody be a shepherd. He has to meet the qualifications. And as Paul told the, uh, the the church, the elders of the church at Ephesus, there in Acts chapter uh, is it 21, I believe, uh, uh, feed the church of God or shepherd the church of God in some translations, uh, which Jesus, uh, the, the church which Jesus purchased with his own blood. And so, uh, the work of shepherds is related to the blood of Jesus Christ, so the local shepherds, as well as the shepherd, the one true and living shepherd, uh, the, the shepherd over all of us. And so even the shepherds are going to have to answer to the good shepherd, Paul Peter says in First Peter chapter 5. That's right. That's a good point. Very good connection there with that. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> All right, let's come back to the text. Um, anything? Oh, verse 16. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss this for just a moment. Brian had some weird ideas about this earlier. Um, <laughs> verse 16, Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and they will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, discuss what this actually is referencing. And then we'll back up and look at some of the ways this has been abused. Um, who, who would fall into this category? So he says, I have other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. So he's talking to primarily Jews. You think about it, both the John and his disciples went preaching, repent for the kingdom of uh, heaven is at hand. Jesus and his disciples preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they primarily, when they went out on the limited commission, went to the house of Judah or went to the Jews only. But who's this referencing? Who are the other sheep, do you think? Gentiles. Those, those who would be Gentiles that would believe. Yep. Exactly. Going all, isn't it going back to even Zechariah's prophecy um, that he makes after John the baptizer is born, where even he refers to it being good news for the Gentiles? Mm. Yeah. And so we, th this is nothing new that the Lord says, oh, by the way, let's grab a few more folks in this. This has been his intent from the very beginning, that even those who weren't of a physical Jewish descent would be able to become a part of his people, even to the point where Romans 9 through 11 explains 
that, in a sense, the Gentiles were also brought in to make the Jews jealous because they had rejected God, and God's bringing the wild branches, grafting them in, in hopes that the natural branches would then return as as well, or a result of that. Um, also, any any Isaiah, thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 2, verse uh, yeah. verse 2, uh, or verses 1 and 2, and it shall, shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations, shall flow into it. Yeah. That's <clears throat> exactly right. right. I've got to go answer uh, my door here. Okay. It might be something. Uh, if you've ordered pizza, don't show it to us because we're hungry. That's right. It'll be hurtful. I, I okay. order. You know, it, it is kind of interesting that <laughs> there has always been a conversation uh, in the scriptures that God's desire wasn't just for Israel. It was for the entirety of, of mankind. And, and it's kind of neat. You go to the promise to Abraham back in Genesis that through him, all nations will be blessed. And Paul, Paul camps on that idea in Galatians and said, look, even before Israel existed, God was desiring to reconcile all mankind to him. So <clears throat> what I think is interesting here is that Jesus is saying, he isn't saying, Hey, maybe I'll have some other sheep too. He says, I right now have sheep among the Gentiles. There are Gentiles that, that were, you know, like Matthew chapter 8 and the Roman centurion. There were Gentiles that believed in Jesus. There were Samaritans, uh, John chapter 4. There were Samaritans that believed in Jesus. There are already uh, believers in Jesus, but there were always godly Gentiles. And we meet one in Acts chapter 10. And, and all over the world, there have been godly Gentiles. Uh, throughout time, there have been godly Gentiles. And so we know that God, you know, it, it should, it's one of the strangest surprises that wasn't a surprise that the, uh, that the Jews seem to be surprised that, well, I guess God must love the Gentiles, you know. Uh, well, how many times could he have said it, you know, that 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 he loved the Gentiles, that he cared as much for them as he did for the Jews, that um, that God's desire was that all men should be saved. And it's it's a funny uh, surprise, not surprised uh, kind of moment that why, why are they puzzling over this? Yeah. Had they truly searched the scriptures? You know, that's what Jesus says. You search the scriptures for in them that you think you have eternal life, and they're the ones that testify of me and of the salvation of the Gentiles. Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. So, Brian, we made, we were discussing earlier before we actually began the study. Um, this passage is used by some to support a different concept. Yeah, this will be typically a passage that whenever you point out to somebody who is of the Mormon or Latter Day Saint persuasion, they'll say, "Well, you know, we're." They have they have a whole bizarre history coming from one of their books about uh, a group of people in the North Americas that were uh, quasi Israelites descended from you know related to the Israelites the Lamanites the um, I was about to say the Jacobites that's not right uh, the the uh, all the, the different groups and, and like I said yeah. historically these groups never existed but the, according to the Mormon Church they did and they'll try to make the case that Jesus is making a reference to them here in that sense. And, and that's, that's absolutely not true. Like I said, it's a, uh, it's a, it's spurious. It's, it's a, uh, you know, a very, very terrible logical case. But whenever you try to pin down and say, you know, where is, where is any of this in the Bible? They say, well, Jesus mentioned yeah. he has other sheep. That's not what it's, I'm talking. Isn't it Lehi that um, built a boat based on instructions, series of boats or Nehi? It's either Nehi or Lehi. It sounds like the, the orange string. Um, I was going to say there's an orange drink too, right? Yeah. But uh, anyway, they, they were supposedly called by God and left and came to a new land. No, for, right. no, no Levites came with them though, but yet I they built they're... a temple, offered sacrifices. And, um, so they use this and there's also a passage about a branch. Yeah. So they'll, they'll go yeah. down back to the old Testament where there's a language about two branches and, yeah. and then uh, I sticks. think it's Ezekiel. The two sticks. Yeah, the two sticks, and he'll say, and they'll say, well, that's actually the Book of Mormon and the Bible, and it's actually is. It, I mean, he says it's Israel and Judah, but uh, yeah. the, again, it's this. Uh, I'll grab just about anything and and tell you that's what it means, and you know, yeah, kind yeah. Of silly. You know, getting but, on to yeah. Book of Mormon, if if mm -hmm. we're not straying too far, I just want to point this out mm -hmm. to our listeners. Of all the places. Uh, geographical cities and places, etc., mentioned in the Book of Mormon, except for Jerusalem, <laughs> they've never been found. 
not one. There's absolutely no geographical or physical evidence of any kind that any of the events yeah. recorded in the Book of Mormon ever, uh, Book of Mormon ever took place. Also, uh, the Mormons do not worship the one true and living God. They worship the, the God created by uh, Joseph Smith. The same yeah. with the Muslims. They don't worship the one true and living God. They worship Allah, who was created by uh, Muhammad. And and so, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we're brothers. We all worship the same God. No, we don't. Yeah. It's a, it's a man created, we, man made image of that one. We worship the I, God who revealed himself to us in his word. Yeah. I would not even call Mormons a Christian denomination. I would say that they are no, like no, Islam, no. entirely separate religion. Yeah, I think there's a. I think that is even a misnomer, Christian denomination. Well, sure, sure. But as far as their origins, you yeah. know, it's yeah. Um, you know, and used to, used to nobody view nobody in so called Christendom would recognize them, but now, uh, matter of fact, there was a time that that Christendom, uh, or especially Protestantism did not recognize Catholicism as being a part yeah. of, uh, of the truth. And yeah. of course now everybody's all inclusive and, uh, you, you know, you got to accept everybody, uh, and you can't exclude anybody and you even got to overlook and tolerate sin, <laughs> but, uh, the Bible doesn't. Well, see, and, and that's the point right there. When you said the, the Bible doesn't. It's not that we're trying to pick apart in this simple discussion here. We're not trying just to pick apart something that is believed that's different from what we believe. It has to do with what does the Bible teach? When you stack up everything of a religious group and what they teach and you compare it to what the Bible teaches, how do they line up? And in the case that we're talking about Mormonism, there's so many discrepancies, even where Joseph Smith tried to connect the two books with quoting from the scriptures in, in some limited fashion there is still an abuse. It is still not rightly handling the word of truth. Um, they have them worshiping, they have Jesus on this earth 400 years before he came to this earth over in, over here in the Americas. They have them baptizing people for the remission of their sins 400 years before Jesus ever came. Um, and so when you have such big discrepancies, then you have to come up with, like Brian was talking about a while ago, you have to find something to try to somewhat explain it. Um, and and the, the answer, well, and I'll give you one more case of point. We'll, we'll get off the subject here one time, real quick here. We were talking with, um, to, to um, Jehovah's Witness. No. Well, it was Mormon, sorry, it was, it was Mormons there. And um, they were talking about the latter, the, the prophets, and the, 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 the uh, Latter-day Revelation is what I'm trying to say there. And so one of them said, um, I said, give me an example of a Latter-day Revelation. And there was, there was two people, as they all do, two, two girls studying with us. And one of them said, so I'll tell you, I used to have three earrings. I didn't. She did. She said, I used to have three earrings. But the prophet gave the message or, or whatever they call the, the head guy there that God has now said only one, ear in e one earring in each ear. That was an example of an updated rule that had been passed down. So I asked him the question, well, now Peter says that he's given us, um, second Peter chapter three, verse one. Sorry. My brain decided to uh, not catch up with me. Second Peter one, verse three, Peter here makes a statement there at the start of this second letter there. Um, I'm on, it's almost there. Sorry. Um, Guys, what am I thinking about? As his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Peter says all things. So I said, so what you're saying is, when Peter said that, the Lord had not given them all things. But now he's given them all things. You know what their answer was? He gave them all things for what they needed then. Hmm. But we need more things now. So Peter's statement was true then, but not true today. Anyway, um, off base there a little bit, but... It was interesting. They, they, they stayed studying with me and this other fella. They're pretty consistent. They came Sunday night services, some probably good six month study. I was real surprised it went that long. All right. So back to our text. That's how that's an example of how sometimes verses can be abused and misused, <coughs> pulled completely out of context there. Okay. So back to John 10 verse 17, let's bring this back up again, since it's been a bit since we've read it. 
Um, therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. All right. No one takes it from me, but I lay down myself. I lay down of myself. I have power to lay it down and power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. All right. Let's talk about this for just a minute. What is he saying with this statement? And in what he says, it will upset a number of people there. Any thoughts on that? Uh, about which part of that? Uh, about well, the father loving him, about laying down yeah. his life? What do you, well, what do you... if, if effectively, effectively, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I do this. And I and I have power to lay it down, power to take it again. The, is there anything well, we, yeah. well, we know that whenever by calling God his father, they understand, and they said this before, we want to kill him because yeah. he claims to be equal with God, calling God his father. So, So every time Jesus says, my father... Um, that's, that's a pretty heavy uh, idea. I think I've mentioned it before. That's not typical Israelite language towards God. You don't call God your father. That's, a, that's where I've said that, again, one of the remarkable passages in the Bible in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, let me tell you how to pray, and he says, our father, you don't go through the Old Testament and find prayers like that. You find the prayers addressed to God as Jehovah. So, um, so that's, that's not something that was, if I say, that's not kosher. You know, you would understand that uh, it really wasn't. I mean, it really was something a little bit of a irritant at the minimum and at the maximum blasphemy. You know, they they yeah. they do accuse this of being blasphemy. That's how serious they took the the father language. Um, I I actually kind of uh, puzzle over kind of what he says in verse eighteen. He's when he says nobody's going to take my life. I'm going to lay it down. Now Jesus has repeatedly said, you know, they. Even when they put him to death, they really couldn't put me to death unless I gave him permission to put me to death. I want to pause for a second um, and and throw out that Jesus, you know, I, I've heard some people try to make the case that, well, then Jesus' death is really suicide, you know, because no, it's not. It's called murder. Uh, you know, the the in the book of Acts, the apostles will say, you murdered God's high one. You know, you you know, you put him to death. That, that this is not when Jesus says, I had the power to stop this and I didn't stop it. That's not God saying, you know, well, then it's my fault. That's absolutely not. And and it's important that, that that distinction is clear because throughout the scriptures, it's going to it's going to be very plain. You murdered God's holy one. You know, Peter will say in Acts 2, I think Stephen says it. Um, you have it time and time again about, you know, the, the direct language here. But Jesus is saying, I have the power, I have the authority to let them put me to death. Um he also talks about the authority to take his life up again. Now, what's kind of unusual is in every reference to the resurrection in the New Testament, it says that the Father raised him back up. So, um, I, you know, I, I does this mean that Jesus, as being one with the Father, has the power to take up his life again? Uh, that's actually the, the, the thing that kind of perplexes me, or perplex maybe isn't the right word. The thing that intrigues me about this statement is uh, what is Jesus describing here? So um, those are a couple of thoughts I have about that. You know... Uh, Jesus came to do the will of his father. And so the fact that he did do the will of his father, yes, his father's love for him, which was natural and which was eternal, was intensified in that. Just as he loves us, he loves the world enough to give his son for us, God does. But he has a special love for those who have uh, embraced his love. And then even then, those who are faithful, who continue to be faithful, they're, they're raised to walk in the inside. They, he has a greater love even for them than he does for the disobedient children that he loves. But he's, he's got to love the others uh, more because they're uh, obedient. And so Jesus came to lay down his life for the Father. He did that. That was his Father's will. And so his Father loved him. Uh, all the more uh, for uh, for that. And as far as uh, the murder is concerned, the Jew, uh, as I understand it, the crucifixion, uh, death by crucifixion could take up to several days. And uh, even though they had their hands and feet nailed to the cross, they could sustain their lives by lifting up with their feet in order to breathe. But it was excruciating. And so they would they would not stay up there on 
uh, you know, in that position. They would have to uh, stand best they could on those na nails in their feet to breathe, and but then they would have to relax again. Uh, and they could sustain their lives for, for, for up to a week, I understand. But Jesus did not come to sustain his life. That does not mean that he committed suicide or even, as we say, suicide by cop or suicide by centurion. Uh, he came knowing full well that they were going to put him on the cross. And this is why the father loved him. And this is also God glorifying him. In John chapter 17, it says, glorify me with the glory that I had before you from the foundation of the world. And God said, I have glorified you and I uh, glorified your name and I will glorify it again. Uh, that may have actually been before referring to this crucifixion that, that God was glorifying Jesus in that because he had given his son to die on the cross for all of uh, all of mankind. And so, uh, but I think also in John, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. So in that case, he was saying that he would be raised. He would raise himself uh, from the dead. But uh, all three persons were involved in it. There's a passage in Hebrews uh, raised by the by the Spirit. But some say, well, that's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't know whether it is or not, but it's certainly possible uh, that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And if so, then all three members of the Godhead would have had uh, a part in the in the resurrection. Yeah. Well, I, you've got a couple of things here that are true at the same time. You know, um, Jesus in the flesh taught a message that I came to do my father's will. But at the same time, he taught his own authority. And he and basically this goes a long way to saying the shepherd willingly chose to give his life for the sheep, you know. Um, yeah. God, so for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's one side of the message there. But there's also the side where Jesus voluntarily gave him on self for his sheep. Um, and because of this, he says, my father loves me because I laid down my life. And it's basically my choice in a roundabout saying, in a roundabout way. You know, that's a true statement. And God sending his only begotten son is a true statement as well, I would think, you know. Yes, and several uh, aspects of it. And uh, there was another thing that you mentioned there that, that reminded me of something that, but that train has left the station. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, at, at any rate, uh, 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 I'll, I'll just pass on that. I, I don't know when it's going to come. Well, I don't know you think about it came. shortly. <laughs> All right. Um, any other thoughts on that before we kind of close up this section? And then it'll be about time to close our study as well because we're pushing the end. Um, so verse 19, we see here quite clearly that there was division again among the Jews because of these sayings. So you got two different responses here. One group says, or some said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Another said, these are not the words of one who has a demon and comes back to the evidence at hand. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Okay. So, and this is not uncommon. We've seen this before within the reaction of the people. You, know, you have some who listen and completely basically ignore the substance of what he says. And they accuse him of speaking, in this case, in point, saying he's mad and it's a demon. What does the other say? Look at the external physical evidences. You know, we think about Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and confirm these things with signs, wonders, and miracles. Well, the miracles Jesus was doing was confirming that his message truly was from God and that he was from God. And clearly, there were those who saw that and draw the right conclusion, drew the right conclusion. And I believe the case could be made very easily that no demon ever did anything of a positive nature. They never healed the blind, they caused blindness. They never healed the yeah. the deaf, they caused people to be deaf, etc., etc. And so what Jesus did was completely contrary to what Satan and his demons would have done uh, and would yeah. have liked to. Now, 
I remember the point I was going to make a little bit ago. There you go. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, Jesus died to show his love for the world, and that's certainly right. But he also died to show his love for the Father because his Father sent him to die. Yep. And so the Father loved the Son to give him enough. Uh, he loved us enough to give us the Son. And he loved the father because he loved the son because the son did the will of the father and Jesus love for us and the father both like likewise motivated him to die on that cross. And, and I think it's the same. Uh, what is it? John that says uh, uh, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, that wouldn't yeah. be suicide. That would just be allowing somebody to murder you. To save somebody else exactly and and so uh i think that uh should deal with that sufficiently to anybody who has a love of the truth that's right and looking back to what brian had said earlier that some would the false yeah. claim used about this yeah all righty uh let's see <clears throat> looks like you have one more uh one more question that's dropped in real quick um So let's, do we have a minute to talk about uh, Stephanie's comment? Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'd mentioned it too. I, so I, I don't know if she was kind of picking up on what I'd said or um, wondering, wondering the same thing I wonder, you know, um, that, that all of the language of the scriptures uh, will talk about God, the Father, raising the Son from the dead. So there's, yeah. there's a constant language about the Father raising the Son from the dead. So this is Romans kind of unusual 12, that Jesus, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I said it. Every reference in Acts will be, you know, the father didn't leave, you know, Acts 2. He didn't leave them there. The father raises it from the dead. Um, and so that language is in that sense uh, throughout the New Testament. So, uh, so Stephanie, you're, you got a great question. And it's a question I don't have a great answer for because, uh, well, I mean, uh, what we could say is Jesus is God. So, so he's saying that that power is there. But I also kind of think power here is the concept of authority. That he's just saying, you know, that uh, I, you know, kind of a, I know what's going to happen. I know I'm going to die. And that's the father's going to authorize that. And then I'm going to come back. And the father's going to authorize that too. So I see some of this as the idea of authority that he has. Um, but, um, and, and honestly, I'm not sure what to make of the consistent language that it's the father that raises the son from the dead. If somebody said, well, you know, Jesus brought himself back from the dead. He had that power. I probably wouldn't even argue with him. Because I, I, I might think, well, he is God. I mean, I, I can see that there's a connection to that. Um, but at the same time, the language is pretty consistent about how that came about. Uh, this passage being an exception to that, perhaps. And so, uh, so Stephanie, let me just say you stumped me. I mean, I don't know uh, exactly how to answer that. Uh, you know, we, we do have Bob with us, and Bob might have a better answer. Uh, you know, he, uh, uh, John might have a better answer. But I will say this. I caught that, too, and I'm... I'm kind of, uh, I, I find it an interesting question. So I appreciate the question. Again, you know, Jesus did say, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. And, uh, and John tells us what Jesus meant was that, uh, he would, he would be resurrected. Uh, and so, uh, uh, he, when he had risen from the dead, had risen, that's, that's not, uh, uh, passive that's active he had risen and so he would rise from the dead uh, and so rising from the raising from the dead uh, is an uh, 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 an act that one does with regard to himself but uh, again the father sent him to do that and the father father commanded him to do that and uh, and so to me, again, all three of them had had something to do with that. And there's a whole lot that we'll never understand. I mean, inspiration. I mean, some of us have a fair concept of inspiration, but who can fully explain uh, inspiration or revelation? Uh, uh, so some things that we worry about, I think, unnecessarily. Uh, what we need to be concerned about with what he what he tells us to do. Let's, let me offer this last passage, and then we'll pull the study to a close. Um, I don't know if it will help any, but John says, and John writes, Jesus saying in John 12, 44, he says, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. 
and he who sees me sees him. Sorry, he who sees me sees him who sent me. I've come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words is that which judges him. Get this, the word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. For I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. That's kind of a blending of both situations there of sorts. The authority of Jesus, the authority of the Father, Yet we come back to the authority of Jesus. I love the fact that I've often found this very intriguing where he says, I did not come to judge the world, <clears throat> okay, but to save the world. <clears throat> but then he says, the very words that I've taught, you'll be judged by them, you know. And so, and that, that harkens to the fact he didn't come to destroy because he could have, but he came to save. But the teachings that save are also the teachings that will condemn if people don't listen and follow them. So I don't know if that helps any or just adds one more layer of icing to the cake of confusion. Yeah. <laughs> so, Makes it yeah. tasty. He could have yeah. he destroyed the earth then just as he destroyed the population of the earth yeah. in the flood. Yeah. Uh, That's a good point. But uh, <clears throat> that was not his purpose. His purpose was to save as many as would be saved. That's right. And under the old covenant, uh, they could be in a right relationship under the old covenant, under the patriarchy. I mean, Hebrews 11, uh, the so-called hall of faith or heroes of faith. And as I mentioned, I think, I guess I mentioned it in our, our Tuesday study with the other preachers that I studied with. Uh, Hebrews 11 is as much about grace as it is about faith. Because in every case, God was gracious to give them something to do that would uh, allow them to demonstrate their faith. Yeah. That's a good point. Good point. Okay, guys, I think that's it. Um, let's plan in our next study, which will be two weeks from today. We'll skip next week. Two weeks, we'll pick up with John chapter 10, verse 22. I didn't share this earlier. Um, let me go ahead and bring it up here real quick. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us. You can send your questions to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or email us individually, john at paul at etc. truthfactor.com. And we will receive your questions. And if it's something we can answer in the study, we'll, of course, try to bring it into our next study. All righty, gentlemen. Appreciate you joining me today. Appreciate you at home for joining us as well. And uh, let's, let's hear from you, especially if you're watching this at a later point in time. You can share your thoughts with us as well. All righty. We'll see everyone then in two weeks. Y'all have a wonderful set of holidays. We'll see you now. All right, bye-bye.